Okay, we are going to go ahead and start this um, Thursday, March 17, 2022, Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Welcome to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. And uh, I will um, go ahead and have Ms. Reese um, do roll call before we do the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Here. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Is she online? She is online. We'll note that Commissioner Craig is online virtually. Commissioner Sharon Davis. Here. Commissioner Michael Disman. Here. Commissioner Tick Sigerbloom. Commissioner Dan Shaw. Commissioner Luciana Turner. And if you will all stand and uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Quorum is present and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Ms. Reese. So we'll move on to agenda item number two, public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for discussion and possible action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. The amount of time any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Is there anyone wishing to speak to any of the agenda items at this time? Phyllis Carpenter, and you're doing something with the utility, um, something about, it's supposed to be a 90 day comment, and you guys are only doing 60. Why is that? Because I know that last March or May, there was a study done, and I downloaded, I'm sorry, I'm out of breath. Um, I downloaded Your name for it, the record? It, oh, Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89107, number five. Um, so um, I downloaded the reports, but they're so lengthy that I, I haven't had time to read through it. Like, and the, they, the words that they put in there are so big. It's supposed to be like lame man terms. You're supposed to easy to read for everybody, and it's not. Um, therefore, I would say I would ask to do the whole 90-day public comment period because the reports are way long, and there's like five different ones. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Anyone else here to offer public comment on the posted agenda items, or is it something completely different? I don't know what the items are. Because there is a second public comment period, so if it's not pertaining to what we have to, uh, for business today, it can be at the end of the meeting. Okay. okay. All right. Seeing no further public comment, I'm going to close this public comment comment period and move on to agenda item number three, approval of minutes. Approval of the amended minutes for the regular meeting on January 20th, 2022, and approval of the regular meeting minutes on February 17th, 2022. And I just want to check in with legal counsel. Do we have to take each date separately or can we do it combined? Uh, you might want to take each date separately just in case there are changes. Okay. I'll so move to approve each agenda separately. Okay, so I have a first from Commissioner Sagerbloom to amend, to approve the amended minutes for the regular meeting on January 20th, 2022. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries unanimously. I'll entertain a second. I'll move to approve the second agenda. Okay, so I have a motion to approve the regular meeting minutes of February 17th, 2022 meeting. A second by Vice Chair McCurdy. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, we'll go to number four, approval of agenda with the inclusion of any emer emergency items and deletion of any items. So um, I'll defer to you, Mr. Jordan. Is there any changes that we're making to today's agenda? Yes, there are, Madam Chair. Um, we recommend removing um, item uh, nine from the uh, agenda. Um, this is in regards to 
the four standing committees. And I want to let it be known for the record, the committees have not met, but as it relates to the open um, meetings law, I would like to defer to council to come up and explain how this process will be handled moving forward. All right, Mr. Parker, if you can come and speak to why we are striking agenda item nine at this time. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon, uh, Chairperson Diaz, Vice Chair, uh, Person McCurdy. Commissioners, we're, we've asked that this be removed from the agenda today, first because of what uh, Executive uh, Director Jordan just said, there have been no meetings, number one. Number two, we're concerned based upon the open meetings law and the interpretation from the Attorney General's office that standing committees that make recommendations or have the power to make recommendations should comply with the open meetings law. Again, it's not as clear as it once was, but in the abundance of, of caution, that's what we're recommending from now on. Now, this does not apply to non-standing committees. So there's a difference. And so for purposes of these, we're suggesting from this point forward, we will comply with the open meetings law. And as a result, we're asking this to be removed from today's agenda. Any questions? Any questions from our fellow commissioners? Perfect. Seeing none, um, I'll entertain a motion. Move to remove it from the agenda and also move to make all the standing committees uh, non-standing committees. I don't think we can <laughs> do that, <laughs> Commissioner. But, but um, I'll, can I amend your motion? So I think what I hear from Commissioner Sagerbloom, he's willing to uh, move forward with today's posted agenda, striking agenda item number nine. Do I have a second? I second. I have a second from Commissioner Desmond. Uh, all those uh, in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're going to go ahead and um, entertain consent agenda items number five and six. Mr. Jordan, do you have anything to say or speak to before we move forward with the consent agenda items? Okay. Okay. So I'll entertain a motion. Move for approval of consent. I have a first by Commissioner Scott Black. Second. A second from Commissioner Shaw. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. We're going to go ahead and move on. That ends and concludes our consent agenda item portion. We're going to move to uh, section number three, uh, which includes our acknowledgement of our departed. So, Mr. Jordan, if you could please share that list. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thoughts and prayers go out to the families of uh, Mark Salden, Donald Andra, Derek Scott, and Ridley Dahl. And I also wanted to acknowledge and send thoughts and prayers to Commissioner Craig on the recent passing of her brother. We'll go ahead and uh, just take a few moments of silence to acknowledge that their departure. May they all rest in peace and Commissioner Craig, our sincere condolences uh, as a board for the passing of your brother. We're gonna go ahead and move on now to section, item, section number four. These are items taken separately from the consent agenda. So under our consideration today, we have agenda item eight, approval to award the firm fixed contract for energy upgrade and rehab construction services to valid, validity construction. And so Frank Stafford from our modernization will present and speak to this, this um, recommendation. Okay. Mr. Stafford. Frank Stafford, the Director of Development and Modernization. Uh, this particular item is we're requesting approval to award contract for energy upgrades and rehabilitation services pursuant to invitation to bid IFB 22017. Bid was out for, uh, for a period of six months contract for a period of six months not to exceed the amount of $593,061.58. Uh, these services originate from the Public Housing Department, therefore Davis-Bacon wages and certified payroll is required and will be followed. There's a section three component to this contract that's pursuant to 24 CFR part 135, uh, which related construction is aware of and will comply should the opportunity become available. 
Belady is an African American construction business, and Mrs. Zane Burke is present to answer any questions that the board may have. Uh, the action request on behalf of the Executive Director uh, and Director of Modernization is to request approval for this award to Belady Construction in a not to exceed amount of $593,061.58. And so, Mr. Stafford, I know it was brought up in the public comment. I don't know if there's anything that we can address uh, that Ms. Carpenter brought up with this agenda item, because I think it was this one she was alluding to. No. Oh. Oh, okay, never mind. Mm -hmm. That was in the consent. Okay. Yeah, it was this item. <laughs> okay. There are no further questions. I move for approval. Second. Okay. I have a first from Vice Chair McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Great. Thank you, Mr. Stafford. All right, well, uh, we struck agenda item nine, so we'll move on to agenda item 10. Receive report from the Executive Director on administrative and operational activities of the agency. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, staff and I were quite busy this month. A lot of activities going on. I wanted to, first of all, um, speak to the CNI kickoff. The CNI uh, implementation grant is the grant that we received from HUD. And just for, for, the, for the record, um, 32, housing, 32 housing authorities around the country applied for this grant, and we were one of eight to receive it. It's a two-year planning process that um, ultimately could position us to get 50, up to $50 million in implementation monies to support the uh, revitalization of Marble Manor as it relates to the 100 plan on the historic west side. So uh, we had our kickoff late March, um, um, very, very gut meeting, if you're late April should, or late February, excuse me. Um, good meeting, I wanted to acknowledge both the chair and co-chair for your participation in the meeting and also wanted to note that in the follow-up that we had with HUD, they were very complimentary about the amount of attention and, um, and presence of our electives here in the, in the region. Everyone from, the, from our congressmen um, came on and, and to the extent calendars allowed, actually stayed on and listened and participated. So. That was uh, duly noted. Also wanted to acknowledge the uh, involvement of um, our resident council president, Madeline Rhodes at uh, Marble Manor. And also wanted to, uh, in addition to that lengthy process that we participated in, I wanted to acknowledge Madeline and her leadership team for the work they did and a uh, community affair that was held at Marble Manor in conjunction with Black History Month. And if you can, um, if, if, if you can take your attention to the screen, you know, there's a few pictures of Madeline, her leadership team and myself. Um, you know, a big part of this, and this all ties back to the CNI, a big part of this process will be community involvement. And over time, uh, for, for a number of reasons, we, we've struggled with really getting resident participation and, uh, in, in some of these processes. And I just wanna take my hat off to Madeline for whatever she's doing with her leadership team to get people interested, get people out, uh, get people to buy into the significance of being a part of this strategy that will ultimately result in us having a better redevelopment plan for, for that community. So wanted to acknowledge that, thank you. Um, as a means of building stronger collaborations, as well as expanding our opportunity for affordable housing, staff is preparing to put a request for proposal on the street for project-based vouchers. Um, the last few years, staff has spent a lot of time via the, um, the RAD process revitalizing existing public housing units. And we, in order, to, which obviously makes um, a, a better housing choice for those families we serve, but with project-based vouchers, it creates opportunities for us to collaborate 
and partner with other affordable housing builders and organizations. But more importantly, it expands our ability. So it adds units to the overall affordable uh, housing count. And so um, within the next two months, we'll bring to the board uh, proposals that will suggest that we're going to reach out to our partners and um, see how we can collaborate as a means of getting more actual houses on the uh, on the street. Along those same lines, we, we've been involved in the uh, the boutique process of uh, providing vouchers to the homeless population. I say boutique. These are additional vouchers that HUD has awarded us. They're called emergency housing vouchers. And uh, we've worked with the continuum of care at the county. Um, they will identify the, the individuals and provide so, um, services, and we provide the vouchers. And we, uh, we've worked really, really hard to, um, to find ways to better house what we can say is a, a, a pretty tough population. And I just wanted to say that we're making some progress in this effort. One of the things that we did uh, most recently is we went to HUD and asked for waivers. You know, some of the administrative things that HUD has us do became somewhat prohibitive in a smooth process of getting some of these families housed. And so we asked for, we received the waivers and we're, we're starting to see the process open up. Um, we've, we've housed about 120 people in this process. We have 560 vouchers, these boutique vouchers for the homeless. Uh, thus far, we've uh, housed 120, which is not a lot, but I just wanted to note for the record the national average in, in this process is 19%. Our authority is currently at 25%. While clearly there's room for improvement, it's important that you know that we're putting every effort possible uh, together to move this process forward. Um, another thing I wanted to speak on is our, um, over the last few months, I've been doing property tours and meeting with residents. And uh, one of the observations that, that I've made is that um, there, there's a clear opportunity for us to really improve our, our, our service delivery, uh, working with um, uh, organizations and vendors that can help us on the people side of the process, uh, move families from where they are to where they want to be. And I want to be clear, uh, COVID has played a role in this you know, in social distancing. So in, in fairness to the, to the staff, I wanted to note that, but across our portfolio, we're really going to increase our efforts and in, uh, in providing services. And at the end of my report today, as a, um, a means of doing that over the next, or going forward, I'm going to invite service providers to come into the board meeting and talk to you about what they do and in addition, we're inviting those service providers to start showing up at our resident council meetings so that our, 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 our residents can have a firsthand view of uh, services. And, and, and we'll note that a lot of these things are already in place, but I, I'm a staunch believer that says, you know, we just have to keep putting things in front of people, again, to help move them from where they are to where they want to be. Um, in our an, another thing as it relates to, to services, um, we've had we have these monthly meetings at Jamestown Tower as we prepare for the RAD process um, in that revitalization strategy. And I wanted to recognize um, tenants Tim Timothy Morris and uh, Janet uh, current brothers. Uh, Timothy and Janet both have gone through the RAD process already. And we invited them to come over to Jamestown to talk to the residents about that process. Uh, as we all know, whenever we're talking about doing something different or making changes, uh, even, even our work in general, we have to move at the speed of trust. And as people understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, it, uh, it, it creates more of a, or less of an anxiety. And so, you know, as staff has been making these presentations on a, on a monthly basis, we thought it would be to our advantage to have someone come in who's already gone through it. And uh, this past month would have been my, my second 
such meeting. And I can tell you, it went a lot better than the first. So just acknowledging those residents for um, coming over and helping us. Uh, I also wanted um, to mention that in our last meeting, there was a lot of conversation from you, the board, around the, uh, the monies that the governor has allocated for affordable housing um, here in, in, in the state. And on um, this past Tuesday, staff and I presented to the, um, the Joint Interim Committee on Government Affairs out of the governor's office. And this is a committee that allowed us and uh, other affordable housing providers and housing authorities in the state to really talk about the work we do. And as a result of doing that, um, we're, we're at the table as it relates to consideration for those, uh, when those dollars will be distributed. We're of the mind that um, it'll be sometimes mid-April mid as we learn about the distribution and the award process. But I just wanted the commissioners to know that we were present in this meeting. Um, you know, hats off to Frank uh, Stafford and the development team who did an excellent presentation on who we are uh, and, and more importantly, the needs that we have around continuing to either preserve or develop affordable housing. Uh, with that being said, I, I wanted to, are there any questions, first of all, let me ask that. I, I wanted to- um, um, We do, Commissioner Sagerville. Okay, it's a comment, so he can wait. Okay, um, so I, I wanted to now, uh, Martha, are you gonna introduce our guests? I have guests who are going to speak about some of the services that are provided. Um, uh, so if you're referring to the Just One Project, I do see the Just One Project. I'm not sure about Dress for Success. Okay. Dress for Success is here too. Yep, they're both here. Okay, so why don't we have, um, why don't we have someone from Dress for Success come up? And I have a couple things after that as well, but I wanted to get them on the agenda and, and Okay, so at this moment, we'll go ahead and invite Norma and Triago, who's here on behalf of Dress for Success. Excuse me, Madam Chairperson, if yes. I could intervene real quick, briefly, as we have to get one of our board members off to work. Okay. Um, yes. So we want to um, show that our board members, our Marble Manor Resident Council is here. Okay. Unfortunately, one of the treasurer had to go and attend a funeral. So Madeline Rose, Resident Council President of Marble Manor Community, and this is Maya McMillan, the first vice and then the second vice, and then Miss Beautiful Ellen. Um, if you don't mind me briefly having a moment of them standing right here so they can see you as we talk with you for a moment. On February 22nd, 2020, the historic Westside Marble Manor Resident Council had its first annual neighborhood, neighbor back to neighborhood black history event. There's a passage in a blog by Koshin P. Ellison, published February 13, 2019, entitled, Showing Up for Life Means Showing Up for Others, which can be found on 10percent.com, which reads, the simple act of being present with another human being is so moving. What actually matters is showing up to what's happening in front of you and all around you. Showing up for life means showing up for other people. And showing up for other people helps us show up for life. This is how we are of service to others and ourselves. We humbly thank all who showed up, the commissioners <laughs> who showed up. Um, Ms. Turner actually came and showed up as well as thank you. Fred, where you at? Thank you for showing up, as well as executive director. Thank you so much for showing up, as it is very important. So we thank you for coming and showing up for the resident council, Marble Manor residents, our honorees, and the community. Nobody cares about what you say. They care about what you do, how you make them feel, and when you show up. We look forward to building a relationship of trust, unity, and quality customer service <laughs> for the betterment of the residents and the community. There's a couple of quotes that I would like to share before leaving from Maya Angelou. I have learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. I come as one and I stand as 10,000. And this was said, and I'm going to tell you why it was said. It was said because even though I may stand as one, I am here as 10,000. 
The life journeys of those who came before me led me to me, and mine will lead to someone else's. The journeys, uh, the journey that is meant to continue towards a country and Africa and a world is always getting better from one, uh, from one relay race to the other. Thank you. We thank you all who showed up and we look forward to working with you, Commissioner, as well as you've expressed us coming closer. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you from the board. And if anybody would like to say something briefly, please do. Thank you. <laughs> can we, can you guys come back up? Yes. Are these for me? Yeah. Okay. Well, yes. Well, yes. These files are for, for the council, from mm -hmm. the council to the housing authority for those who showed up, and there's a card inside of there as well. On behalf of all of us. On the board. Yes. So, so, uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Ms. Rhodes, on behalf of the board, thank you for coming to the meeting and doing this nice impromptu recognition. Uh, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ellen. I'm secretary um, for the historical uh, Marble Manor. Um, I'm kind of like new to this, but I hear like a lot of money going around. Um, and we just want to utilize it. We want to spend your money the right way and respect it. Um, we're trying to change um, the minds of people um, that are living, you know, we're spending your money, you know, we, we're trying to get the neighbors, you know, to get to you know your neighbors again. Um, a lot of people, you know, they, it's public housing, they call it the projects. Um, I call it where I live, you know. Um, it doesn't change who I am. So, you know, we, we just live in a world that a lot is going on. And um, I want to make a difference. You know, I hear a thing about, you know, everything that you guys are going to do, then, you know, we, we want something, you know. We want to we wanna utilize um, what you have to give, you know. You don't make a budget if you don't spend the money. You understand? And I just, um, just want um, you guys to keep my family um, in prayer. Um, my cousin was the one that turned herself in for killing his son. Um, it was a discipline that went wrong, you know. Um, it was a lot for him because he was responsible for killing his son. You know, he couldn't revive him. Um, he did, um, he stepped up to what he had to do and he admitted that, you know, he was disciplining his son and he died. So, I just want, you know, people to keep, keep us in your thoughts, your prayers, or, you know, however you meditate about it. Um, for our family, um, for his mother's side of the family, his name was General. Um, so, just, you know, keep it in mind, it's, it's a horrible thing, you know, especially when you kill your child. You know, it, it, it goes bad. So, you know, it, it's, it, it is what it is, you know, and the family just, you know, want to respect that. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson, and our thoughts and prayers are with your family and everyone in Marble Manor as well. We, we love your energy, we love your care, we love your passion for wanting to build community there. So keep doing what you're doing, Ms. Rhodes, and the rest of the board and council there. I think there'll be great things coming down the road for you all as Mr. Jordan will continue to help us get there. I know he's charting the path. Well said, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. And thank you all. And I uh, appreciate that. Yeah. I was like taken aback. It's the first time after almost three years on this board that we had something impromptu and kind. So I'm like, yay, <laughs> can we have more of these? It's awesome. I'm sorry. Go ahead. One, more, one more thing. I do also want to disclose as well, and um, you can pass this out to them if you don't want, if you want to. Yeah, to, the, to the rest of the board, so y'all can have this information as well. Okay. So this is basically this is a historic West Side Marble Manor Resident Council meeting. This is what we're getting ready to have on the 19th. We will be talking about the CNI grant and let, relating it to the rest of the residents, how and what it actually is. Because a lot of people, what is this? When they're building? When you breaking down? All of the above. You know what I'm saying? So um, and so a lot of people just want to know so they can be ready to move versus preparing and understanding they they can actually have a hand in it. So yeah. there'll be 
communicating about it, but we'll also be looking to do meditation Mondays with the residents, talk to me Tuesdays, walk it out Wednesdays, tech Thursdays, as well as financial Fridays. So we can equip the residents with these things that are simple, but we're pulling out all the different resources, the connections, so that we can pour over into the community, not just our community, but we're also gonna go to the different boards and different locations so we can keep the ign igniting that fire amongst everybody. So show up. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, I appreciate Ms. Intriago's patience. I know that um, in my job as a city council person, I come across situations where families are having a hard time, especially during the pandemic, to make ends meet. And then they have pressing matters like being prepared for a job interview or an internship for a young one. And um, I know this organization has come through um, when, when there has been a time of need. So. Without any further delay, Ms. Norma Intriago from for Dress for Success. Well, let's clap for her. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to follow that spontaneous moment. Well, Absolutely. thank you all so much, respectfully. Truly grateful to have this time to talk a little bit in spotlight on the work that we're doing, um, being it's so significant as the pandemic has disproportionately impacted women. Um, so just a little intro on who we are. Um, and of course, I had to show the picture of, of the self-sufficiency program and, and what we did there in partnership with Southern uh, Nevada Regional Housing Authority. But we've been around in the Valley for uh, since 2009 for close to 13 years now. And, and this work is really done in partnership with our referral agencies, with our community partners. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but the font is not displaying well, so some of it is um, not visible, but it's really a gratitude to Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority and all our community partners who really um, champion the work um, and make our work possible to take care of women and their families. In getting to know us, um, Dress for Success is a global organization. We are the affiliate of the leading global organization focused on the empowerment of women. Here in the Valley, we're filed as our own independent 501c3. Um, we've served and impacted the lives of over 10,000 women helping them lead to self-sufficiency. Globally, um, we're one of over 120 affiliates in the US, uh, a part of 25 countries across the world. So our vision. Our vision is really that equity, right? We, we want a world where women do not live in poverty, right? Are treated with dignity and respect and have that autonomy, that ability to contribute back to their community, to strengthen their families and overall able to impact their community. We know that when we invest in women, um, that dividend is fourfold. I won't even say twofold. Um, it's the best ROI, the best investment in community is when you invest in women. So what's our purpose? Our purpose really is to create change. So when we say economic empowerment, I know most people know what's by our name, right? The, the, the attire. But really what we want to do is to help women break the cycle of poverty. Um, more so really long, long-term objective is generational poverty. Um, and that truly is our purpose. We're so much more than just an outfit or the suit. We know that the suiting and that um, attire really is what leads a woman to that self-empowerment, that sense of image, and that's where it starts, but it certainly isn't where it ends to take that woman in that trajectory to economic success. Here, sorry about that. So who are the women that we serve? We serve anyone who identifies as female, is age 16 and over. We don't age out. They're either unemployed underemployed, socioeconomically challenged, no questions asked. Our primary audience is really that low, mid to low income women, primarily really over half of the clients that we see are um, receiving some form of public assistance and certainly live under what's the medium um, average income, which is about 58,000. So certainly they, they fall under that. 
Um, we have um, special programs in the way that we've partnered specifically with Southern Regional Housing Authority, where we're not just providing the traditional, even when you just look at the point of entry, the suiting program, traditional attire for interview, right? So that if a woman is not seen, she's not going to be heard, she won't have a seat at the table. And then, of course, once she lands the job, that woman doesn't have to spend the paycheck or an employment wardrobe attire, regardless of the industry. But also, for graduation programs like the amazing program like the self-sufficiency program. We want to honor and support our community partners when a woman is hitting milestones, not only in work, but in life. And so we do that. We also provide attire for internships and other professional extras that a woman may need. Once again, what, what most people know us is because it's in our name, right? Uh, it's, it's the attire. And while we know that it's a catch-22, um, if you look at, let's say, a client that came to us recommended um, from a shelter, a survivor of domestic violence who fled with the shirt off her back, um, and she, got, she, she needs to land back on her feet, um, you can imagine what a quandary it is when you don't have the attire or as one client told us, you know, my resume didn't match the way I looked, right? We want to make sure that we uphold that woman in dignity. Um, if you ever tour our organizations, it's completely a boutique client concierge approach. It's as if that woman uh, is matched with a stylist, a personal shopper, but we also have that same approach to the complementary career development support. What we want to do really is to democratize networks, right? So that we know that women um, who may be challenged economically, um, they don't have the access to these paid services. So it starts with the suit and with that interview, once she lands that job, she then gets a, a wardrobe capsule over a week to two weeks worth of employment attire across all industries. Right now, we're doing a lot of scrubs. We're also doing a lot of um, uh, non-traditional attire for construction areas where they're thriving, as well as more um, semi-casual attire for women who are upskilling, which we're helping to digitally upskill women, right? We want them with 21st century skill sets and are looking at uh, sectors of growth like tech. And so they may be working remotely and from home, and those needs are very, very different. So that's the suiting, but what you may not know, it's all the ways that we holistically touch a woman beyond that suit. And what we really try to do is to create a very uh, safe space <coughs> for women. And so that when we, we start with that suiting, right, you build the trust. Think about it when you go to your hairdresser, your stylist, your shopping. It's a little bit of therapy. There, there's actually a science to retail therapy. That's kind of the environment that we try to create, especially for, for women who come from trauma or women who are often, because over 70% of our clients are BIPOC identifying, meaning they are black, indigenous people of color. And usually women of color are not only underrepresented, but certainly underestimated. So we want to make sure that we have the environment where we are uplifting them. So it starts with that, as I said, the suiting. But then we're also providing all the career development. We know that that journey, even in landing the job, we don't just want the woman to hit that milestone. We want to have a continuum of care so that she, she secures the job, but then she has career progression. Many of our women are also on survival job mode, right? We want them to break the cycle of poverty. So we want them to have career progression, a career pathway. We want them to get promoted. We want them to get salaries. Even part of what we do in closing the loop is also exposing women to leadership opportunities, to civic engagement. Many are even volunteering with us and are now paying it forward with our clients. And so we want that journey. Um, wherever that woman wants to go, we want to see her all the way at the top um, including the boardroom. <laughs> oh, so let me go back. Uh, so that was her career center. I think we're, uh, one of the things too that you may not know and that I refer to um, with 21st century skill set is to digitally upskill women. So um, because Dress for Success Southern Nevada really relies so heavily in partners, um, we've also have 
public and private partnerships. And so we've harnessed that intellectual property, right? I don't have to create um, modules uh, and, and, and curriculum and training um, workshops. That already comes with Google. Google offers it to us. We have a global partnership with Google. And then in turn, I'm providing that to women. Um, many, many tracks from very basic, um, how to use ba very basic Google tools to all the way to design thinking for entrepreneurs. We've also seen that entrepreneurial um, and with the way women have been pushed out of the labor market allows them also more flexibility. And so we've seen um, as well as an uptick. And then women of color tend to be um, also uh, be a significant driver in growth as far as uh, business owners. So those are some of the, I'm going to go a little bit faster on that. So what we try to do, once again, is holistically. Um, and when I talk about democratizing networks, that also means that we harness the power of our volunteers and our corporate partners. So just the way that we have a concierge approach with the suiting and the styling, we then open that network of professional women, those career coaches and mentors who can take these women in this journey, who are also speakers um, for financial literacy um, and so on for investment, right? So we are, we're addressing the full need. We know that if a woman is also addressing her personal life or those barriers um, to job retention, she won't really thrive and be successful. So there are also health and wellness components to our workshops. But once again, it's opening that Rolodex, all those corporate supporters, I don't rely just on their dollar donations. They really help me with my program delivery of services. We're primarily a volunteer driven organization. So once again, I harness the power of their intellectual property so that they can give them the career coaching and the mentorship that um, a woman needs to be successful um, in all the workshops as well. And this is just a slide on leadership. Once again, we want that full trajectory. We want that full career pathway pathway so that if a woman should decide. Um, there is a very interesting stat, too, when we look at um, the disparity, especially in mid-management um, level positions. And we see it here in Nevada, though we've made tremendous gains in gender equity, certainly in political representation. We're one of the lead states there. Um, but we're still not there with the pay, uh, with the wage gap. Not too soon. We just celebrated Equal Pay Day. Um, there's a lot of work to do, and then especially for women of color, particularly for indigenous women who are ranked the lowest, and Latinas, and certainly African American women as well. But those those are those are the women where we we need to shrink um, that that gap. Um, so what we're doing in the way we're evolved, so you may have known us as a provider of workwear. Um, we've become more focused and people are getting to know us more for the career and professional development. Um, but also, once again, more, more than a laptop, I really want a podium there. It's all the way to the leadership. We know that we, we're really not going to change things if women are not also in positions of power. These are the many ways that we partner with our community um, and sort of that what we bring in um, with our partnership and that global access, right? We're able to harness that. But there's so many ways on so many levels that you can activate with us, whether you're a volunteer, a community partner, um, a donor, an investor, um, or, or where we can come together and collaborate in programming, which we've done. And uh, I'm certainly very excited to hear um, one of our partners did just one project because we've worth collaborative with some of those clients. And, and we know that the way we're tackling the problems today where women are, I know that the numbers in January as far as job creation look really healthy and robust, but most of those jobs went to men. Women were, are still below where they were. We had in 2020, 13 million women get pushed out of the labor market. Um, we saw some numbers, over two more million um, last year, and we know that that's going to continue um, uh, to go on. Another thing that's happening right now is that the safety nets are not fully back on. Child care is still a huge issue for our women. The burden of caregiving still primarily falls on women. Also, there's gender segregation in some of that employment data that you will see because women tend to have 
two jobs because they tend to be in service sectors, uh, according to a study from the Winston sector, in the early stages of the pandemic, women represented 60% of frontline workers. So we are absorbing the risk, and then we have the burden of caregiving. So it's no surprise why women have left. Um, another thing that I think is really, um, it's a strong suit of dress for success is because we are a global organization. Not only am I having daily conversations with the women that I'm serving and understanding their needs or what those barriers are to employment or the kind of employment that they're looking for, but we also collect this data globally so that we're able to see trends. And the trends that stand out, and I don't think this is the one, that's just a picture of our partners. I, I had sent another update in presentation, but um, the data that really does stand out is that women, number one, are looking for flexibility as far as hours, right? Um, because those safety nets are still not back on. In March, we were still 8%, I think actually 9% lower with child care providers. And for many advocates, those numbers were already seen as dismal. So you can imagine where we are today. Um, so women need flexibility. Women also need 21st century skill set. That's what we're seeing the gap because a lot of our employers and corporate partners are saying, hey, but Norma, there are so many job positions. I'm having a hard time filling them. And when we talk about 21st century and digitally upskilling, we don't just mean the tech jobs or engineering or the STEAM and STEM fields. We also mean that the world has had to pivot really fast. Um, corporations worked remotely. Project management has changed. The way we collaborate in a virtual world has changed. And we need to specifically close the gap to digitally upscale women of color. So that's just um, some of the team members. That's myself and my a colleague who's uh, the director of community impact. And so we're super grateful for, for this time, for this honor um, um, to be able to share our mission and the way that we can band together as a community. Another big, big trend is wraparound services. And so that's why I'm so grateful for folks like the Just One Project and other community partners who are able to do that because so many of the issues that women face are cross-cutting issues. If a woman is hungry, if the babies are hungry, um, you know, most likely they're not going to learn, they're not going to be job ready, they're not going to be able to retain the job if they have barriers to transportation. So it really takes a community. It's uh, the work in partnership is super critical today, public and private partnerships. And so I'm eternally grateful to you all. If there is any woman too that's in need of services and support, um, I certainly want to offer and extend those services and support. And, and for me, this is very personal because this could this was my story to a degree I know um, what it's like to ex exist in both a world of privilege and a world of really great poverty and, and trauma when we migrated to this country and what my mother went through so I do this really so that another woman doesn't have to go through that level of hardship I really do it in my mother's name in my sister's name and I know that when women are empowered and when we invest in women families or stronger communities thrive so thank you so much for your time Thank you, Ms. Triago. Very fitting for um, Women's History Month. March is Women's History Month, so love the, the love and empowerment. But um, I'm sure there's so much more we could talk about how important this, this work is to all communities um, here in Southern Nevada. So thank you for um, expanding my knowledge of what you did, because I really only thought about the suiting aspect, but I really didn't know about all the other initiatives you have going. So definitely, I need to be upskilled and informed in everything you guys do. So now I'm going to go ahead and ask for the Just One Project uh, team to come up to the podium and share about the work, amazing work they do in our community. Hello, hello everyone. Hi. Hello. 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 We'll, let, we'll let Casey be the monkey in the middle. Oh, perfect. <laughs> uh, sure. And if you could just briefly all state your names so that we know who's talking Absolutely. to us when you're on the microphone. Absolutely. Thank you. That would be for you, the tall. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, it's really such an honor to chat with you guys today. Um, we have had a few of you, uh, the commissioners out to our space um, 
Chairperson Diaz, you have been to our space and it's uh, awesome to be able to talk to you all today um, and let you know who the Just Fund Project is. Oh, it's, oh, oh wow, that was a big difference. Um, so the Just Fund Project, um, our mission is to connect the community through volunteerism, um, to really just help build stronger and healthier communities. We activated 10,000 volunteers last year alone. So anybody listening, we're always looking for volunteers to get connected in the community. Um, our vision really is to inspire impact and change. We really want to create real change in the community. Um, our culture is really unique. Um, we are client centric. Every um, program that we create, we think about our clients first, how they feel before they come to us, how they feel um, while they're participating in our program, and how they feel uh, after and what we want the takeaway to be. Um, we love collaborating with both public and private um, community partners and uh, we're just really grateful for the opportunity that we are able to um, offer such amazing programs with so many collaboration partners. Marissa? Yeah. Marissa Cervantes. Um, the Just One Project has a variety of diverse programs that provide inclusive services for the entire community. And through these programs, we touch the lives of over 20,000 people each month. And as you can see behind you, um, there's the list of all of our programs. We have Community Connect, our In Inspire Impact Change Youth Program, Market to You Home Delivery Program, Community Market, No Cost Shopping and Wraparound Services, Community Connect Self Development Classes, and our Pop Up and Give um, Mobile Markets. And, and again, we're, we're touching the lives of 20,000 people um, every month in this is Casey. Oh, Casey. This is Casey. <laughs> Uh, Casey Flair. First, I just want to start and say, Norma, thank you so much. Uh, you've been a huge partner of ours, and we really appreciate all of the work you do in our community. Um, and just so you know, the Just One Project is 85% female-led. So Yay! that's <laughs> um, Just a quick, some numbers uh, for the commission here uh, and the Housing Authority is to know that we do serve 20,000 plus clients every single month, distributing over 600,000 pounds of food. 750 volunteers. I won't go through all these numbers. I think more importantly for who we are and what we do for the, the community and in particular with um, the housing authority is the number of um, properties that we attend and do our pop-ups at and serve in the community that you all are making an impact in. Uh, Marble Manor that was here provide services there. I know we mentioned uh, James Down. We were just there yesterday. I was out there signing up 65 plus uh, clients for not only our commodities program, but also for our golden groceries program. Uh, and the importance behind being able to provide those services to uh, our community in an impactful, dignified way is something we really strive to do on a, on a daily basis. And um, the numbers and the impacts that we've made are only allowed because of the work that all of you are doing and allowing us to come in and serve. So we appreciate that. Um, the, the next one here is just a, a view of our active client list. Um, as we mentioned, 20,000 plus. Of those 2,700 are homebound clients. Uh, every single day, we have drivers that are on the road delivering these groceries directly to the doorsteps of our most vulnerable seniors, some of them being uh, in the um, properties that were discussed earlier as far as Marble Manor and James Down. We have four drivers, volunteers, uh, as Norma's team does as well. We rely heavily on our volunteers that are allowing us to take uh, a month's worth of groceries to each one of these green dots each month. So not just once this isn't one delivery, this is every single month we are visiting uh, these locations. Talking about um, our pop-ups and what we're really known for in the community is us popping up at a location and providing services uh, to that community. We provide 13 pop-ups each month, uh, the third Saturday uh, of each month at these locations. Those would be the pink locations that you see on there. Those are on CCSD school sites. We're in a two-hour time frame. We're able to serve over 10,000 um, community members with groceries. Uh, if you look at the green dots, those are our 23 senior housing locations. And really what we're looking at for those is the, is the next slide. And that's our partnership with the Housing Authority where seven of those 22, uh, 23 that we are going to are part of that. James Down, as you can see, is on there. Robert Gordon, uh, Harry Levy, and you guys can read Bennett, uh, Dorothy. So those are our ability to go into the community, bring the groceries into the community, and really make an impact at those, uh, those locations. Um. And uh, 
this is our future. I, we like to share that in 2018, we received $193,000 private donation from a private funder, and that really changed the trajectory of our organization. We were able to um, open up our first brick and mortar location, and, um, and now we have our sights set on building a wonderful space that is open to the community, again, focused on removing the barriers. Um, having somebody that is food insecure, we know that there's many root causes and we want to help them figure out how to be self-sustainable. Um, removing barriers and really just treating with um, dignity and respect and offering a space where our clients want to be and they're open um, to receive services. And uh, for any of you guys that haven't come in, uh, we would love for you guys to take a tour. Um, we are located on Bonanza and uh, Rancho and Bonanza. Um, and uh, one thing that we're super proud of is that most people that come in and tour, um, they say that there's an energy unlike any other place that they felt. And that's because we have 30 plus amazing client-centric teammates that are dedicated, cause-driven, um, passionate people about serving the community. So please, um, if anybody wants to come take a tour, just reach out to us and we would love to show you around. That's it. Thank you, just one Thank project. you so much, thank you. Oh, Brooke, yes. there, the past chair is asking, is there contact information on here or how can they or we get a yes. hold of you in the future? How can I set up a tour? I'm curious. Oh, so yes. I'll give you my card. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other questions? So much. Commissioner Davis, you have a question? Oh, a card. Okay. So just come on down and give everyone your contact info. No questions? Comments? Okay, thank you so much, thank you. this one. And I'll give it back to you, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to um, conclude my report with some acknowledgments, if I may. Um, I want to say a, a happy belated birthday to both Commissioner Davis and Commissioner Desmond. I, I learned in some uh, communications with them this month that they both celebrated birthday, so. Happy belated birthday to you both. Happy belated birthday. I uh, also wanted to acknowledge um, 30 years of employment effective in this month and Fred Heron, 31 years of employment. Okay. <laughs> Third, right? Fred, Fred's correcting me here. Okay, 30 years? 30, 30 for me, 30. For okay, well, I haven't gotten there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm good. I, but but I, want, I wanted to recognize you first. So I wanted to recognize Fred for 30 years of employment, and then I'd like for Terrence Foley from I, our IT department to come up and recognize a retirement that we have um, coming up at the end of this month. Mr. Foley? Good afternoon to you all. It is my distinct honor to recognize one of our best today, Mr. Rod Yenchek. Mr. Yenchek has given us 31 years of dedicated service we are taking this opportunity today to recognize everything that he has done for the information technology department. Mr. Yinchek started somewhere around 1990. At that particular time, Rod kind of looked like he did on the left. We had movies such as, I believe, Home Alone, uh, as well as uh, Dancing with Wolves. We would like for him to be able to go and see some movies once he retires. These are the type of computer systems that he worked on <laughs> in 1990, about 30 years ago. If any of you remember floppy disk or uh, Cisco routers that we actually work with, multiplexers and things of that nature, that's kind of what computers look like then. Obviously, they don't look like that today. So he did quite a bit of uh, uh, system um, programming on some of these particular devices, and we just thought that we'd share that with you. Uh, again, later on in the 1990s, uh, those of you that uh, had cell phones that looked like those on the left, BlackBerry devices, and then our compact servers, that's kind of what they look like uh, in the middle there. 
So Rod worked on uh, technologies such as Nobel uh, Network Services and running things like uh, Alpha uh, Deck, uh, as well as uh, Wide Area Network Programming. In the year 2000s, we migrated uh, from Novell Networks over into the Microsoft Networks. Most of us now work on Windows machines. Uh, we just completed a, a Windows 10 rollout here in the last six or seven months. And again, email came abroad, and uh, as well as Red Hat, Red Hat and Linux. Uh, so in the middle of uh, 2000, he met his uh, lovely wife, Angela, who's here with him today. Uh, they've been married since 2013. Uh, he also has a, uh, two other brothers on the left. I believe one of them uh, looks exactly like Rod, if I'm not mistaken. He has a twin and also uh, his mother there on the right. So what will Rod do with all of his free time? Will he continue to... Uh, follow all of the Marvel worlds, or will he spend time with his family, uh, Rod and Sophia on the left, Rod and Luna in the middle, and snowboarding with his brother? That's one of the activities that he enjoys doing. Well, so at this particular time, we would like to recognize Mr. Rod Jenchek of 31 years of valuable service in the IT department. It's it's uh, at some point it's been treacherous. Uh, most of the time it's been it's been a great great experience. Uh, I loved working for the housing authority. You know, it's been really good to me. You know, they kept this whole time. You know, I, I was such a screw up in my twenties. I can't believe they let me work here. But I'm I'm so thankful for that. And you know, they just kept the the, the paychecks rolling in and the providing the insurance. I'm so thankful for that. You know, I could put you know food on the table, clothes on my back, and you know, provide me with a, a home over my head. And it, it's just been 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 a great experience. Um, the the everyday grind was a little bit challenging. You know, Mondays were even worse. But you know, hey, overall, it's been a great experience. And how many of uh, how many SNRHA staff has uh, has uh, you know worked under seven executive directors that that, that 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 you know need this and that and everything else? But you know I, I think I got that record beat. But uh, anyway, to to staff, I just want to say how I appreciate you guys and um, it, it just you guys have just made it all worthwhile. And again, I keep saying this, but it's been both an honor and, and a privilege and a pleasure working with, with this staff. And the IT, I, I can't say enough about how, how great I appreciate you guys. It's, it's been, been, been a great experience. And uh, when I go out in the world, I'm going to hold you guys close to my heart and, and think about you guys. And I, I really am going to miss you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Yenchek, but I just wanted to say there's no coincidence in you bowing out when we're going paperless, huh? <laughs> I said there's no coincidence in you bowing out and retiring as we're about to transition to paperless, huh? <laughs> He's like, no comment. I know. No, thank you. I did have a question. Which housing authority did you start with? Because we merged. I was with the city. City of Las Vegas? Las Vegas. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you.
Thank you for your longevity and, and your dedication to the organization. Anything else, Mr. Jordan? Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Well, what a highlight. Absolutely. That's a great, great way to conclude our meeting. I'm going to go ahead. Madam Chair, could I make a comment? Oh, yes, you did have a comment, yeah. Commissioner Sagerblum. Um, so a couple of things. First, uh, I was watching Channel 8 over the weekend, and uh, they had a, a political show on there, and they had the executive director of Hand on there. I can remember her name, but a real nice woman. I, I, Audra, Audra, yeah. yeah. And anyway, she just went off on how great you are. And she Thank was you. so excited that we have a professional director of this, this organization and how he's going to work on the project-based vouchers and it's going to revolutionize Nevada. And so I just wanted to brag about you because she was bragging about you and how you're going to revolutionize Nevada. So, so that is really exciting. Thank you, Commissioner. And the other thing I always want to brag about you as far as the homeless vouchers, because I know that's been sitting there and I think you're now starting to get it moving. and. Obviously, the, the faster we can do that, the better. So thank you. And thank you. And the team and I are working collaboratively with all of our partners to make housing, affordable housing, uh, a better option in this region. But thank you very yeah. much. And so finally, uh, on the project-based vouchers, is there a way the state can do that or the county can do that too? Can we participate in that or is that strictly a, a federal thing? No, it's, it's an, there's an opportunity for the county to also be a part of the process. Yeah, and we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, we're actually looking at a, a separate process as we're looking to the county to, to support us in funding around building. From a reciprocal standpoint, we see some opportunity to support the county and its projects with additional uh, project-based vouchers. Yes, sir. And I just want to, before I uh, open the last period of public comment. I wanted to see if any commissioner had anything they wanted to raise or comment on. No? Okay. No comments noted. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to our final period of, oh, do we have, we have Vice Chair McCurdy. Yeah, just a comment. And it, again, it's really exciting uh, to see where we're headed. I uh, just want us to uh, be mindful, like as we look to the future around who we're going to be partnering with in terms of uh, new housing development and all these uh, really phenomenal opportunities that we look at what they're starting to do in terms of rental increase mm -hmm. on our properties. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that's um, very important for all of us here because uh, the last thing that I would want us to do is to reward anyone that's taken advantage of the economic situation that we find ourselves in. So just let's be mindful about that as well. But that's, that's just it, just f flag for me to the board. Thank you. All right, we're gonna go ahead and open the last period of public comment. Comments raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the Board of Commissioners for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. If you wish to speak on matters not listed on this posted agenda, please step up to the podium, clearly state your name and address, and please spell your last name for the record. And the amount of time any single speaker is allowed will be limited to three minutes. Anyone willing and wanting to do public comment at this time, please step forward. I'm Jerry Cox, COX. I live in Robert Gordon Plaza, 522 North 10th Street, Apartment C. Uh, an item that might actually fit in item, uh, in item eight, uh, energy upgrade and rehab. Our front doors fit so badly, they leak all the way around, most of them. And I face Bonanza and a vacant lot across the street. And when we have a strong north wind, I actually get uh, dirt blow in through the lower door, right at the bottom corners. Actually, didn't sweep up too much of it. It's kind of hard to sweep dirt into an envelope, but I brought some. And if we, re we could get the frame and doors replace new ones so that it fits nice and snug, it should reduce our uh, electric bill for heating and cooling. And I have a sinus condition, that dust blowing in really does me in. And it would cut down the dust that blows in. That's what I, uh, that's what I had, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cox. I know that uh, Mr. Jordan has taken note and all the staff that are here. So we appreciate you coming to tell us about it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? here for public comment. Phyllis Carpenter, <clears throat> 5200 Alpine. Happy St. Patrick's Day anyways. Um, 
So I've asked for a meeting with the director um, numerous times. Each time I'm shot down, um, he can meet with Ms. Rhodes. He can meet with Tina, the new president of Sartini, but he refuses to meet with me. He sends me to Ava. Ava has known about the issues that I spoke. I actually went to her office yesterday. We, I was supposed to, she was supposed to call me back at 11 and I was down on that side of town. So I figured I'm just going to pop in and, and have a sit down with her because if I'm in her face, she can't you know, not, she can't just push it off, push it off. So I sat down and, and she already knew about most of the issues um, prior, but um, I, I would like a sit down with him. Anyways, um, it was very rude of you to show up at Robert Gord, or excuse me, at um, the trailer park, Mulan Erd, Earl. They waited for you for like an hour and a half the other day. You showed up late. They said you couldn't answer any of their questions. Um, and that, that kind of upset him. They said that there is a hole in the side of the, the gate because it runs along the freeway, that trailer park does. And that the homeless, there's like six of the new trailers that was just put in a few years ago, they're empty. And the homeless are coming in and they're, they're, they're afraid that they're gonna start living in them and take over that trailer park. Um, as well as um, you guys say you support the resident councils, but it seems like the only ones that proper from prosper from that that is is the organizations that the employees form to do the support for the residents, and we don't get any support. Um, I was I was on the Marble Manor Resident Council, and she was appointed. It's supposed to be the duly elected resident council, as well as it says in the CFRs that it's the duly elected resident councils that the. Um, Housing authority or the management have to be invited into a meeting. In our bylaws, it says that they they can they can show up whenever they want to observe the meetings. So we need to go through and redo the bylaws, um, as well as the annual plans. Um, why is it that they North Las Vegas just had their annual plan? If you're Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority and you all came together in 2010, why is each municipality still pulling their grants? You know what I mean? And the other day in the paper, they put a, a, in the legal notices, and I'm one of the people that do get the paper, but they justify that that's how they get the public comments. That's how they tell the people about the public comments. But how many of you get the paper? You know what I mean? How many of you get the notifications? It used to be they sent them out in the mail anytime there was an annual plan or a five year that was coming up of, uh, notifying us of a meeting. And in the newspaper, it used to be they put them in for a, a week straight. Now it's with like two days, I think, is what I, from the papers that I have read, um, which I think that needs to be addressed. Um, yeah, there's, I guess that's it. Oh, and section three is not a training program. It was an act of Congress, and they keep saying it's a training program. It's not. It's the most qualified, low-income individual gets first dibs at that job. Until they have denied it, then they can go outreach to whoever they want. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter, and I believe, Mr. Jordan, you wanted to provide some remarks or context. I, I did, if it's appropriate, Madam Chair. I just wanted to say for the record, um, our, our process will suggest that any of our resident council leaders and councils, I will then continue to meet with them. Um, we have approximately 17,000 families we serve, and we have a process in place. The, the sitting down with those 17,000 individuals is just not something that's feasible. And I'll use my process and leadership and staff to address those individual issues. So this denial of a meeting is not quite accurate uh, in the capacity of a resident leader and in the capacity of a resident leader and those concerns regarding the council, more than willing to sit down and chat. But those individual issues need to go through a process that we've established. In addition, um, as it relates to my property visits, uh, we're going around, we're visiting visits, and when and if there's an opportunity that I'm not there, as in the trailer park, all of those conversations start off with a wholehearted apology for having people wait. In this case, I think we showed up 30 minutes late, called before we came, um, started the meeting actually, instead of having people sit and wait for me. So just for the record, I wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. 
Thank you. All right. Um, I guess without any further business before the board, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn. Everyone have a wonderful St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, ma'am. Let me get out of here. I'll see you at 3.30. All right, thank you. All right. in my building. I do a lot of research. I've researched HUD laws. I've read my lease multiple times. I've read our bylaws multiple times because I have many of our residents coming up and asking me, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? I'm at a loss right now. I don't know who to go talk to. I don't know how to get in touch with someone in housing that I need to talk to. I don't know how to get in touch with somebody in upper management and Nevada hand. I can't get any information. I'm not president. I understand that. And I apologize to Haywood. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but he's not available to talk. I asked on multiple times for meetings with him. And a one on one. I, you know, anonymity is very important to me because I live in this community and I need to know what I'm talking about. So I do a lot of research to know, to have the knowledge to help my fellow residents know what their rights are and to let them know that they do have a voice and it's okay. It's called your First Amendment. You can speak, you can stand up. It's okay. You can't get in trouble for that. Um, and that it's not right. And I also let them know it's not right for anybody to threaten you with a lease violation or a write-up, you know, or tell you, like I said in last meeting, what do you expect? You live in housing. It's, no, this is not right. It needs to be written up. I would love to have the opportunity to sit and talk with upper management in Nevada hand to let them know what really is going on on our property. We have security issues. We were promised in our lease that we, not a security guard, 
but that our property is secure. We have locked gates. We need key fobs to get into the building or any access to anything. We are not safe in the back. The gates are broken that are coming into the property and the lights are out, out in the parking lot. We just got that, oh, stop, sorry. You can finish your thought, finish oh, that okay. thought and then that, that'll um, be it. You know, which makes it very dangerous. Um, I brought this up, I wrote it up two weeks ago and gave it to our, our committee secretary to let her know that the gate is broken from this sidewalk in. It's actually on the south side of the garden area. Broken, unlocked, people walking in and out all of the time. And eight lights in our parking area in the back are out. And nobody can see what's happening to all of the damage in the cars. So this past Thursday, somebody actually came in, walked right through the gate, broke out a window on a car, alarm went off, walked down, picked up a scooter, decided to walk out, go out to a car that was waiting and come back in again. Uh, while somebody was, I'm witnessing this off of my balcony. Dangerous, dangerous, dangerous. I report, I report, I report. I see something, I say something. Nothing is being done, nothing. I don't know where to go from here. People are afraid. I don't know what to tell them. So I'm asking for advice or direction. I'm very frustrated, I apologize. No worries, we, appreciate, we understand, um, Ms. Sprinkle. And so I think Tim will be more than happy to get hopefully that um, appointment going to speak to upper management about all these issues, but public safety is a huge one. And so a if, if uh, let's say the property management can't get it under wraps, then that's when they have to kind of also bring in the local law enforcement authority that can help maybe keep a more vigilant eye or the lighting needs to definitely be addressed. So just go ahead and talk to Tim and hopefully he can right. get you channeled with the right people. Thank you. Thank you. Can I make a comment? This is just me. I keep hearing the same complaint and this is an old saying where a child said, talk, 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 when do we eat? And my question is, when will they eat? You're looking, you're investigating it, but it's not doing any good. So we need some teeth, not just talking, please. Please, it could be you one day. You may get old one day. You may be poor one day. You may be blind one day. You may be disabled one day. You may get COVID. And then what will you do then? Say your name, first name, last name, spell it out for us. Madeline Rhodes, R-H-O-D-E-S, Marble Manor Resident Council President, 914 West McWilliams Avenue. <laughs> um, on the agenda items, there was a couple of things that were stated and I uh, understand there was an ad hoc committee that was um, formulated to have a conversation about the executive director that would be coming into. And now I would like to know what participation did you have from any of the residents at the location and what outreach did you have as per the CFR does state that residents have a voice in all operations from beginning to end, from management, from operations to rehabilitation to all of the above. So what involvement do y'all really do? Because I haven't heard nobody at all whatsoever reach out. And how do you guys come to a determination? Because their last executive director that we had y'all saw the uproar of how the people did not have a voice and the executive director so what have y'all done as commissioners to reach out to the different organizations the different housing developments to make sure that they had a voice in the choice or the examination of the person who's going to be the executive intern running the operations of this place so that's one thing i definitely would like to know because i know i haven't heard anybody um whatsoever um, so that is, and then also a lot of times, oftentimes people come up here, but where do y'all communicate with their people back when y'all have meetings and communication with stuff? Because nothing's posted, nothing goes up, but y'all's agendas. And that's about it. But no response in seven days, no response in 30 days. We don't hear nothing to the next meeting and until y'all have come to a conclusion of a decision. Where's the accountability that y'all have sworn to actually have to communicate verbally with the community to actually bring about self-sufficiency? Now, to also speak to um, Mr. Shaw, I want to bring up, there is a, actually, that's very interesting that um, we've been having several meetings, myself and um, other, other uh, organization called A Solution Group been having meetings with the city, actually talked about the affordability and everything that's going to work for us, the deprivation, land, property, all of up. 
ask to make sure that to make sure they um that they get resources not just one aspect if any and everybody is paying attention the world is in a crisis and if we don't pay attention we are going to be contributing factors to the demise of our community to know to have the information and not do something with it is something that's very detrimental and i would love to be able to sit with the whole board to be able to present this whole solution that will actually be very beneficial as we are the only organization that has brought tangibles where 30 representatives where 30 jobs were given to people where at least 15 youth received their OSHA 10 and OSHA 30 training on job training and where we are preserving the wealth of our African American people that's in the historic West Side and our elders who have code violations that have been put on them. So we've attacked everything by meeting that need. And therefore, we'd love to sit with you all, as that is something that you said and expressed is a very, we have numbers. We have partnerships with, with uh, Youth Build. We have partnerships with Nevada Workforce. We have these partnerships to bring these resources to the residents and to not just the residents, but to the surrounding areas. And I would love to be able to have opportunity to sit with you guys so you guys can actually hear and see the tangibles, not just talk, but teeth. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rose. Um, I just want to assure everyone that we as a board only have one employee in our purview and we are taking the, this, you know, succession very, very seriously and um, we're vetting it and we're analyzing it very thoroughly to make sure that we do get the best executive director we can have. And so I'll leave that. Uh, I see Ms. Carpenter also wants to come up. So I'll, we'll go ahead and make sure you say your first and last name for us. It's Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine. Okay, so when I come up here and I talk about the humidity in my bathroom, they came out Tuesday, did another mold test. I had one done in June. They don't need a mold test. They need to figure out where the leak is under the apartment. Um, this is a mold, or excuse me, a moisture detector. Mine apparently is more sophisticated than, than the maintenance people. And the guy that came out the other day, he said he had an infrared something or another and he, and when I was asking him about it, the maintenance man told me, just be quiet and let him do his job, please. And um, when I tried to show him that this lights up all the way in the red in the laundry room and in the bathroom, he said he didn't care. Um, and it's just frustrating to me because I'll invite any one of you to come to my house and walk in my, sit in my bathroom for 10 minutes and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. It's not right. It's not fair. And... I shouldn't have to figure out what's wrong with the apartment, you know, and what's causing the humidity. You know what I mean? I've been up here. I've almost been there two years and I've been up here constantly and they just, they don't even get back to me until Ava got back to me yesterday at 438 in the afternoon. I contacted her on the 13th and this is the first time she even emailed me back. It's not fair. And security, I really haven't seen them on the property. I know in the last two weeks, I called them twice. The one time the guy had been living behind the dumpster for two days when I called him. The next, the next time I called, there was an abandoned stolen vehicle that they took the tire off and just didn't even leave it on a jack or anything. Um, I called security at about five o'clock in the morning. And then I ended up having to call Metro later in the day because it was still sitting there. I don't know what to say other than accountability. And there is none. Thank you, Ms. Carpenter. Anyone else wishing to participate during this citizen participation? Please come up to the microphone. State your name and first name and last name, please. First name is Darrell. Last name's Hawkins. H A W K I N S. Nine Hundred South Brush, Sartini Plaza. On the seventh of this month, uh, we had our water shut down, and um, when they turned it back on, the unit above me toilet started running, just constantly running. Uh, I was going out of town for a couple of days, so I didn't, you know, I just closed my bathroom door to just to reduce the noise. When I came back on Sunday, it was still going on. And so I went up and asked her about it. She said she had been calling since Thursday, placing service calls, and um, nobody responded. So on Monday, I came back on a Sunday. On Monday, I placed a service call. And uh, I went down and talked to some of the people in the maintenance and things like that. But the reason why I found out the reason why they didn't respond is because it wasn't an emergency. The water was running constantly for four days in the toilet. And these are tankless toilets, which are noisy when they flush. 
and it's constantly going. The lady that was standing there in apartment four, 418 was wearing earplugs because of the noise. She said she just had been calling them constantly on a daily basis, but they didn't have to respond until 10 days because it wasn't an emergency. Um, I just think that something should be changed about that. It's a lot of, we're in the desert. It's a lot of water wasted. Um, just wanted to bring it to your attention. I'm usually bringing water to you all the time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Hawkins. And I'm sure Mr. Grossley took note of uh, that so that he can have the conversation with our maintenance staff about priorities and especially water waste. Um, hi again, it's Sarah Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. I wanted to apologize for my timing. Um, it's okay. We we kind of, um, if you want to pick up where you left off, because we already heard. Um, just feels like they're a gang. You know, everybody in the company, if, as, if they're younger, they haven't really gotten that um, spunk about themselves. So they don't handle anything, but um, we're going to call and let you know that someone is coming by or you can see a home. Other than that, if it's um, a problem, they send the older lady at the front desk and, you know, she is very vicious. Mm. I was raised to be respectful. On my way here, I was screaming on the phone, God bless you, have a great day, because they keep calling me. I am really feeling like this particular company singles out single mothers and it makes it easier you know i showed him when i moved there um that i am fully covered i am very responsible i have a pretty decent credit score things like that and when you just review everything that i've gone through with this gentleman he backs up basically his behavior and his demeanor as well everybody talks to me crazy so i get to talk to you crazy as well I don't think that anybody that is, is doing a business with anyone should be spoken to in any type of disrespectful manner. In regards to your age, and forgive me, in regards to your race, in regards to if you're a cat or a mouse, if I'm doing business with you, you should treat me with respect, especially if I'm treating you with respect and I'm doing my part. I've put in ceiling fans in that home. I have downstairs ceiling fans for my children's rooms because even with the air being fixed to, to their fixing and my fixing, my children still can't breathe. Any tenant that is willing to fix your home up better than it was before you moved there, I don't feel should be treated the way that I'm being treated. And I apologize again. I didn't know that when I started crying because I'm so frustrated that you could hear me in the bathroom. And I sincerely apologize for the outburst. I am just beyond frustrated at this point. I don't know how to verbalize it accordingly and properly. And I don't know what to do to protect myself and my children. It is the holidays. And I really feel like they are putting me in a position where I can lose my voucher, my housing and all of my funding to move elsewhere. And there's nowhere else to go. Okay. Um, that's, that's just really it. I just, I, I really feel like I'm dealing with something out of like a lifetime movie and it's bananas. You know, now that I've calmed down a little bit, I feel like I can articulate myself a little bit better. And I've spoken to my worker and my worker was able to tell me to come and speak with you all because she's done as much for me as she possibly could. And she's been very helpful. However, if I don't get my inspection by the first, then have a great day, figure it out. That leaves me, you know, nowhere. All right, then. Thank you. Mr. Gressley, is there someone on hand that can help? I don't believe we have anyone in the room, but we have her papers, we have her name, and we'll be following up with her. Thank you. How are you doing, commissioners? We're doing well, Mr. Sinclair. If you can state your name for the record. I'm St. Clair Haywood of Rose Garden. I'm not in the best of health, but we have a problem at Rose Garden with the lighting in the parking garage. It's not Nevada Ant's problem. They put in lighting that the whole fixture has to be changed in the parking area, which I think is quite ridiculous. They've been ordered for 10 months. We're in a very dangerous area. And I need someone from Southern Nevada Housing to look into this. Can't blame Nevada hands, but it needs to be addressed. And that's all I got to say. Have a good day. Thank you. Any further citizen participation? Seeing none, we're going to close citizen participation and I'm going to adjourn this meeting and then we have a Rose Foundation meeting so don't leave. We, we stand adjourned.
So here you go. All right, I will now start the meeting, annual meeting of the Board of Directors of the Resident Opportunity Self-Sufficiency Empowerment Foundation, AKA ROSED, right after this last Regional Housing Authority meeting. So Ms. Grizel, if you can please help us by doing roll call. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. President Olivia Diaz. Here. Vice President William McCurdy II. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig, Present. Commissioner Cheryl Davis, Present. Commissioner Sharon Davis, Present. Commissioner Tick Segaboom, Commissioner Dan Shaw, Present. Commissioner Luciana Turner, Present. Treasurer Fred Heron, and Here. Secretary John Gressley. Here. All right. Thank you so much. Form, it seems like a, oh, go ahead. Finish. Present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you very much, Ms. Grizel. Um, item number two, citizen participation. Items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the Board of Directors of Resident Opportunity Self-Sufficiency Empowerment Foundation until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. If you wish to speak on matters on or off the agenda, please step up to the podium and clearly state your name and address. In consideration of others, avoid repetition and limit your comments to more, no more than three minutes. To ensure all persons are equally are offered an equal opportunity to speak, each subject matter will be limited to 12 minutes. As a courtesy, we would also ask that those speaking, those not speaking, be seated and not interrupt the speaker or the directors. Are, is there anyone here to um, give us any type of citizen participation? Seeing none, we'll move to agenda item three: approval of the agenda. I move approval of the agenda. So I have a first uh, motion to approve the agenda by uh, our executive director, John Gressley, and a second by Cheryl Davis. All those in um, favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. Agenda item four, for discussion and possible action, um, we have 4A, approval of Rose Foundation's budget for fiscal year ending September 30th, 2020. Um, and who will speak to this? matter mr Gressley. well i guess i will i was hoping that mr heron would be here and he he had hoped that this item would be earlier so he could attend but i would just point out this it, it's not a very large budget it's a small budget that's balanced and that represents the support that we're able to provide through the receipt of charitable contributions as a 501c3 rose foundation for the benefit of those that are not on the board is a, a separate organization with the housing authority but set up for the purpose of receiving charitable contributions to support various activities of the Housing Authority uh, benefiting our residents. So we have a budget for $25,500 and I would like to recommend it be approved as a member of this board. I'd like to move for approval of the budget. Well, we have a first, uh, so just so I'm clear, we have uh, A and a B to approve. So just seeking, seeking clarity from our legal counsel, do I need, does that need to be stated in the motion? We're only approving A at this a point. A at this, this point? Series. Okay, yes. so this motion to approve is for 4A. Can Correct. you clarify? Yes, motion to approve item A, budget. Okay, so I have a fir uh, motion to approve 4A by Commissioner Black and a second by Commissioner Davis, Cheryl Davis. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously and we'll move on to 4B, approval of amendment to the Rose Foundation's Articles of Incorporation to be consistent with the second amended and restated bylaws and to submit the amended Articles of Incorporation to the Secretary of State uh, and here in Nevada. Yes. Commissioners, the background on this is that the bylaws were amended, but the Articles of Incorporation uh, have not been ca caught, caught up to the new amended bylaws. And we thought, for the, and this was basically because of the change in the number of members of the board. At one time it was a 15 member board, but after the changeover in the organization of the Housing Authority and of the Rose Foundation, it, the bylaws were amended to reduce it to the 11 that it is today, but the articles of incorporation were never amended. So this is simply to update the, the Articles of Incorporation, file them with the Secretary of State to reflect the, the current membership of the board. 
Thank you, Mr. Gressy. I'll entertain a motion to approve 4B. So moved by Commissioner Cheryl Davis. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Luciana Turner. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Carries unanimously. And uh, do I have to open it back up to a second public comment or no? Yes? No, you do after the end of the entire, after B. We just did the. We just did 4B. Yeah, you did. It's not on the agenda, but it's on the Oh, oh, it should be. We should have a second we, period we of it. public comment? Yes. So we'll go ahead and open it to public comment if anybody wants to speak on anything pertaining to the Rose Foundation at this time. Seeing none, um, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion to adjourn this. Rose Foundation. I have a first by Commissioner McCurdy and a second from Commissioner Craig. Okay, uh, all those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. We are we stand adjourned.